When the first European navigators landed on the shores of these remote islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they discovered a people who, even though they didn't have a written language, possessed a genuine culture, the Polynesians. But where did they come from, and how did they get to these inaccessible lands at the far end of the world? Undoubtedly, the answer can be found in the Polynesians' passion for the pirogue, a passion that exists to this day. Athletes come from all over the South Pacific to take part in the pirogue competitions. The earliest settlers probably arrived in Polynesia about 2,500 BC from southern China aboard outrigger canoes, first stopping at the islands of Samoa and Tonga. As the centuries passed, they migrated towards the inner islands of what is appropriately described as the Polynesian Triangle. Even though the Spaniard Mendana recorded a stopover in the Marquesas Islands in 1595, Polynesia remained in virtual obscurity for nearly 200 years, until Wallace, an Englishman, discovered Tahiti in 1767. But it was the glowing accounts of the scientific expeditions of James Cook and Francis Bougainville describing the charm and beauty of the mysterious new Eden that evoked worldwide curiosity and excitement. Thus the Polynesian myth was born. In this, the 21st century, the tales that were recounted by the early explorers of the Polynesian islands and lagoons still summon up images of a paradise on Earth for tourists the world over. The Tuamotu Archipelago and Marquesas Islands have been spared from the pressure of tourism and tourist-related activities now rampant on Tahiti, precisely because of their remoteness. In fact, some of these islands still are accessible only by boat, distant lands at the edge of the world. It always amazes me how the Marquisans managed to settle here, how they were able to get here. When they arrived, they found these boulders. They found these six islands. They adapted to the climate and the isolation. They've been cut off from the rest of the world for about 1,500, 2,000 years, a long time. In the meantime, they've created a kind of microcosm, their own world, a world separated from everything. We're 1,500 kilometers from Tahiti. We're alone, surrounded by an ocean. When I'm asked to describe the Marquisans, I always say they're a mirror. The first mirror is this ocean. The second mirror is the solitude. We can't fool ourselves here. On ne peut pas se mentir à soi-même au Marquis. Nukuhiva, the largest of the Marquesas Islands, is a four-day boat trip from Tahiti. It's Sunday, and the people of Taiwahe, the island's main settlement, are off to church. The Polynesian people were originally polytheistic. As a result of European colonization, little by little, they've relinquished their traditional religious beliefs. In Tahiti, the English, who occupied the island until the beginning of the 19th century, introduced Protestantism, while in the Marquesas Islands, the French imposed Catholicism from 1842. Marquesans nevertheless remain very attached to the early religious symbols they identify with. The Marquesan language merges with the Catholic liturgy, just as the religious iconography has inspired the local artists and is reflected in the spiritual themes of their work. These ancient expressions of Marquesan culture that almost disappeared forever after colonization have been undergoing a renaissance over the past few years. 
disorganization of their traditional culture, being forced into slave labor on the whaling ships or in the Peruvian mines, alcoholism, disease. For all these reasons, the Marquesans came very close to being totally annihilated. You could say that the Marquesan culture has endured one hell of a storm. To go from 100,000 men to 2,000, there's no more culture. Only memories of culture. And from these memories, the Marquesans are building a new culture. Who will emerge out of this new culture? In what manner and how? Who will emerge is what you see today. A Lucien wears a jersey. <laughs> and a Lucien is also tattooed. This immense 90 meter long by 30 meter wide esplanade, lined with sculptures given as gifts by the Polynesians from the Easter Islands, has been restored to honor the Marquesas Festival. The esplanade is situated on the site of an ancient community center, a tohua. We're on a Toua. The Toua is a public place where the ancient Marquesans would gather for different events. It could be for festivities, dances, singing, but also sports and various gatherings of a political or military nature. Before going off to war, a census was taken of the warriors, and another census was taken when they returned. This area was also used as a meeting place. When men would leave to go fishing, they would come together here simply to organize their excursion. The same for festivities tied to tattoos. When a chief's son had just gotten tattooed, well, that was cause for celebration. In ancient Marquesan society, tattoos were used by warriors to scare the enemy as much as they were to attract a mate. They accumulated throughout one's lifetime to the point where they covered the entire body. But above all, the tattoo was a sign of social recognition. Once outlawed by the missionaries who viewed it as a pagan ritual, tattooing has been enjoying a renaissance since the early 1980s. By reviving the tradition of tattooing, the Marquesans are re-establishing themselves as a distinct community. Like all the young tattoo artists on the islands today, Raymond creates his own designs, taking his inspiration from the traditional iconography of the tiki, which is dominated by geometric representations. I'm designing a tiki head for the Marquesans. A tiki is a god, a warrior, a, a king. It's a symbol of our people. In my family, we've been sculpting for three generations. My great-grandfather, my grandfather, my parents, even my younger brother make their living sculpting. What I do is sculpting too. I tattoo. Why did you want to get tattooed? To show that I belong here, a Marquisan. My nephews have them. It's good. Do you have children? Just one, a girl. And if you were to get tattooed, that would be okay with you? My girl? Yeah. She wants to get tattooed, to show her girlfriends that she can suffer, to be beautiful. She wants to wear the Marquisan tattoo because she told me, I have Marquisan blood, so I'm going to get tattooed. In Taiwai, where life is pretty much already laid back, on this late Sunday afternoon, the pace becomes even more easygoing. But don't depend entirely on appearances. This friendly game of bingo is fiercely competitive.
In the morning, as the passengers disembark from the Aranui, they're welcomed by young members of the Mavi Mai group who play drums and sing. We did the ma'u, the rikoe, the ioo, the kapatue. The kapatue means the gathering. I think that's what you say. And the mave. The mave hails you and welcomes you. What's the name of the group? That means welcome visitors. Meanwhile, the Aranui crew is busy unloading merchandise that was stowed aboard four days ago in Papete. The containers are lined up next to each other on the wharf with one side open. They resemble a line of bazaar-like shops on a commercial street that springs to life with the arrival of each cargo vessel, and then closes up shop after each departure. A sort of mirage that replishes the economic pulse of the archipelago to the rhythm of 15 beats a year. Having paid its farewells to the Bay of Taiwai, the Aranui continues on a course towards Tapivai, another valley on Nukuhiva Island. A cruise aboard the Aranui is a truly exceptional experience, and not because of the ship's Spartan comfort. Rather, the Aranui happens to be the only way to reach some of the isolated islands and valleys of the Marquesas. This no doubt explains why some of her passengers have waited more than a year to obtain a boarding pass. We are approaching Tapivai. The captain gives the order to his second mate to sound the alarm, more to amuse her than to alert the residents of the valley, for they know by heart the arrival time of the Aranui. The mission of this vessel is to supply the islands with everything. Cement, sugar, rice, every type of food and diesel oil, gasoline for helicopters, everything. It's the umbilical cord between Tahiti and the Marquesas Islands. You could say that the Aranui is the seventh island of the Marquesas. <laughs> a whaler, a small solid craft. Moving from the side of the boat, we watch the Aranui slowly fade into the distance. The 
whaler is loaded to the gunwales and tries to get as close as possible to the village. The crew wants to steer the boat up the river, but the maneuver is tricky because the depth of the channel varies with the tide. After some hesitation, we go up the river, surrounded by dense tropical vegetation. Unfortunately, a few hundred meters upstream, the river becomes too shallow to continue. We must turn around and head for the shore. While the sailors are busy unloading the tanks of gas that will be picked up by the inhabitants in their four-wheelers, a few passengers explain why they're making the trip. I come to see my clients. I sell chewing gum, chocolate. I go around the Marquises Islands every three months. I'm on the Aranui for two weeks visiting all the valleys. Do you have a lot of clients? Here in Tapiva, I've got three. Herman Melville, himself the author of Moby Dick, has penned an account of his sojourn in Tapivai. Taking advantage of a stopover while he was serving as a seaman on the whaler Akushmet, he ran off for three weeks and lived with the Taipi, a well-known tribe of cannibals. The inhabitants of Tapivai live a peaceful life today, content with processing copra, and cultivating vanilla beans, or like Edmond, devoting themselves to sculpting. I was very young when I started hauling copra. All those years of lugging heavy sacks, at 36, I had a serious back problem. Since I have a family, a wife, and six kids to feed, I had to find something to do to feed them. So I decided to take up sculpting. How did you learn? I went to visit a very good sculptor. He never said, do it this way, or don't do it that way. He told me to watch and do it. And I did it. That's how I started. What type of wood do you usually employ? Miro and tau wood are the two types mainly used for Marquisan sculpture. Like all Marquisan artists, Edmo is very devoted to the tiki symbol. It always appears with its beautiful eyes, its nose, mouth, the hands joined, and the legs here. There always has to be a tiki if you want to keep the custom and true Marquisan sense of craftsmanship. You've got to have a tiki. As the Aranui continues on its Marquesas journey, a few hundred kilometers further south, the catamaran Orava slices through the calm blue waters of the Rangiroa Atoll. 80 kilometers long and 30 kilometers wide, Rangiroa is the largest of the 78 atolls that make up the Tuamotu Archipelago. 
Rangiroa is a huge atoll. When you look across the lagoon, you can't even see the other side. You really feel like you're in the middle of the ocean. Rangiroa was originally an imposing volcanic island, but once the volcano became dormant, the island slowly began to sink, while at the same time, a coral barrier began forming around the volcano's rim. The island now totally engulfed had become a coral ring, an atoll. Some of these atolls are completely sealed off from the sea. Others, such as Rangiroa, receives ocean water at high tide by channels, called hoa in Polynesian, through the coral. The Tiputa Channel, one of the three at Rangiroa, is particularly rich in marine animals and is a favorite destination for scuba divers. The Rangiroa Atoll behaves like an enclosed fish pond that has the capability to replenish its own supply of nutritive material. With the rhythmic flow of the channel's currents, the content of the fish pond pour out into the ocean. So we have an entire food chain flowing through the channel, enabling a great diversity of fish to survive on the nutritive sources available to them. We find the entire spectrum of Polynesian animal species here, small tropical fish to rays, even sharks. The constant renewal of resources enables them to live here in harmony with the environment. At a glance, Tiputa presents the image of a peaceful village, yet it's in the midst of a profound tumult. Copra production and fishing are being slowly abandoned in favor of pearl diving and tourism. When speaking about this confrontation between tradition and progress, Antoinette has a very strong opinion. We live on products from the sea, including the turtle. But it's protected now. Too bad. It's the meat of the tuomotu. Apparently, there aren't many left. That's what they say. Is life difficult here? Not for me, it isn't. Those who say it's hard are lazy. If you work, you can live here. You don't have to spend money to buy meat. There's fish, the meat of the sea. All you have to do is go get it. Our parents fished. Our mothers used to braid mats with tree bark. People don't do that anymore. They prefer to buy ready-made. It's faster, but we forget our traditions. You think it's a shame? Yes, I do. If we go on this way, we'll forget our roots. Taking advantage of the early morning breeze, our skipper Bernard and his mate Mahine set a course southward. We're going to Motueye, course 176 degrees. At 10 knots, we should be there in about an hour and a half. We've got 15 miles to go. I think we'll be fine.
The waters of the atoll are teeming with fish during the entire crossing. A fishing line trails behind the boat. The lunch menu is settled. Now it's simply a matter of reeling in a few keringid, and Mahine will be happy to prepare the meal. What were you just doing, Bernard? I was looking to see if there are any spuds. There are three spuds charted on the course. What do you mean by spuds? Outcroppings of coral that form a patch on the surface of the water, especially when the sun's like this. I have to keep a lookout to avoid sailing over them. We lower sail as we near the Motu, or island of Ai Ai also known as Reefs Island. Even in a rubber dinghy, approaching the shore of this island is tricky. The coral reef is visible on the water surface, so we'll have to go downstream to go around it and reach the motu. A few days ago, this was a desert island, but now the Motu has become the target of property developers. More seriously, a few members of the same family that collectively own the Motu have joined together under the authority of the patriarch to erect a guest house for tourists. This simple hotelier style is widely used throughout Polynesia. These guest houses are built according to traditional techniques, most often using materials borrowed from nature, tree trunks for the structure and overlapping woven leaves to cover the roof. The decision to build a guest house on Motu Ai Ai was not taken without much thoughtful consideration. At the other end of the 300 meter wide coral strip, facing the ocean, is actually one of Rangiroa's most amazing beauty sites the natural outcropping that geologists call Feio. It's composed of ancient coral reefs. Terrestrial activity is responsible for raising the reefs above the water and giving them the jagged mushroom-like appearance. Making the most of their excursion near the reefs, the passengers of the Orava try their luck at catching one of the treasures of the Pacific Ocean for their next dinner. Iria, the patriarch, misses the halcyon days when the island lived to the rhythm of harvesting copra. Times have changed. There are no more schooners that sailed from one island to another to gather the copra. People are leaving the motors. They're staying in the village and no longer come to work the copra. All the islands, all these islands have been abandoned. There used to be a lot of people here. Everyone had his own piece of property. Today there's no one left. 
Everything's changed. When the tourists come, they say, it's so beautiful, and they wonder why we all left. And they're right. Why leave everything to live in town? Meanwhile, having left Nukuhiva, the Aranui comes in sight of the coast of Fatuhiva, the southernmost of the Marquesas Islands. The only way to reach this island is by boat. The passengers seem to be extremely curious. For the crew of the Aranui, however, it's work as usual. There are those who sort out the merchandise in the hold of the ship, and those who unload them onto the island sometimes under very arduous conditions. This job naturally requires great physical strength, but above all, there must exist an esprit de corps and an almost clannish ability of the crew to work together as a team. Have you been working on the Aranui long? Yes, 10 years. I used to work the Copra, but this is better. Why? Uh, because we've got a lot of buddies here. <laughs> Think you will stay on here? Yes, till I die. We've got a mix of everything on board. There are Australs, Marcassans, Tahitians, the Tuamotu. Every nationality. Nice, friendly atmosphere. A sailor's life. Omoa is located in one of the only two valleys of the island that is still inhabited. The village is known for kapa, a thousand-year-old technique of making decorative fabric. This skill has disappeared from all the other Polynesian islands. Today, it's only practiced by the women of Omoa. Like all tapa craftspeople, Juliana draws her inspiration from subjects found in Marquesas mythology. Using a brush-like tool made from a lock of hair attached to a small short stick, she reproduces the geometrical patterns and designs of tattoos. We make tapas using three types of trees, three types of bark, the banyan, the maori, and the mulberry. You start by cutting the bottom, and then you peel it back, and after that you remove the bark. And after that, you start hammering. I don't know why it's still not done on the other Marquesas Islands. Who knows? Maybe they left it for us. It's our life. The Aranui nears the spectacular site of Hanavave. The little village appears lost at the foot of the steeply rising walls of the volcano. The whalers of the Aranui sail past the gigantic phallic shaped rocks that mark the entrance to the bay.
The story goes that these basalt peaks earned the bay its nickname, Penis, Verge in French. That is, until the arrival of the prudish missionaries who, with one slight stroke of the pen, quickly named it Vierge, Virgin. A few of the passengers made the 15-kilometer trek from Omoa on foot. They reach Hanavave Beach just as the last rowboats are about to leave. This stubborn Marquesan horse refuses to board the whaler. He'll have to swim to the Aranui. Sunset, we say goodbye to Virgin Bay and Fatuiva. Despite another exhausting day of work, the captain and his crew uphold an old naval tradition. They join in the first dance. Late into the night, as the cargo ship sails in a northerly direction towards Iwahoa Island, the sounds of guitars and ukuleles can still be heard on the gangways and on the pontoon bridges of the Aranui. Leaving Reefs Island, the Orava heads towards the eastern part of the atoll. The waters of the lagoon in this part of Rangirua produce the most stunning colors. An entire palette of blues and greens that are all mixed together as far as the horizon and are iridescent in the sun's rays. We're in Pink Sands, the other side, east of the atoll, as I explained earlier. And this sandbar takes on a pinkish glow in daylight and looks even pinker at sunset. There's only one navigable channel, and since it isn't marked, we have to cross it by day and be very careful. Postcard collectors would drool with envy over this spectacular setting where a solitary shark can be seen passing by now and then. Good 
Mahine leaves her passengers alone for a few moments to return to the Motu, where, as a child, she used to spend her holidays. Her aunt and uncle and their children live there, far from everything, isolated on their small island. We used to live on the other coast in TPP. We were the copra in the coconut trees. But when the cyclone hit, the trees were destroyed, and we stopped making copra, and we came here to this side of the atoll to gather shells. Which do you prefer, the time when you cultivate copra or now? Not the copra. It's hard work. Shelling is much better for us. With the money we make selling necklaces and bags made from shells, we buy food. In Papeete? Yes. We get everything in Papeete. Everything. Gasoline, oil, canned goods, meat, chicken, everything. Here you get only fish. That's right. We've got fish here. The coconut palms are no longer used for making copra. Their only purpose is to provide welcome shade to passers-by. Do you enjoy coming back here? Very much. It takes me back to the years I spent here as a child. Do you prefer those days to the life you live now on the boat? Both. The past and now. The scenic beauty around us and Mahine's nostalgic memories, such as her delightful stories about her aunt, mustn't make us forget that life on the Motu is often quite harsh. We get up in the morning, have breakfast. Around 6.30, Papa goes off to work, and I do my work at home. When he returns, he bathes in the sea. Then we set the table. Everyone is clean. We've all had a dip in the ocean. And then we sit down to dinner. At night, we return to our house. It's built out over the water on piles. We can't sleep here on the beach because of the no-nos. What are no-nos? Uh, insects. They're sort of like mosquitoes. But they're not mosquitoes. They're no-nos. Are they dangerous? Oh, yes, more than the mosquito. We're afraid of them, so we sleep in the house on piles. And that's our life here in Rangaroa. As the Orava heads into the wind towards Tiputa, the starting point of our cruise in the Rangiroa Atoll, we rejoin the Aranui one last time, at the moment when the Hivahoa coastline suddenly appears on the horizon. Before she became a cruise ship, the Aranui was a cargo freighter. Despite the lack of comfort for deck passengers, the Marquesans actually prefer this mode of transport to flying, which is more costly. They take the boat to get from one island to another or to go to Papeite. I went to Papeite to sell tapas, necklaces, and handcrafted souvenirs. I prefer taking the Aranui. Yeah, it's safe, and besides, they feed you well. <laughs> Slightly more comfortable, but still Spartan, the Class C accommodations are similar to the sleeping quarters on a train. 
And yet, even for a berth in this basic price category, you must reserve well in advance to be assured a place. That's how popular the Aranui is. preparing to tie up alongside the wharf in the port of Atuona. <laughs> the Marquesan people owe a great deal to Gauguin. If not for him, how many of us would know of these islands at the end of the world? But how many of the islanders are aware that the artist lived in the little village of Atuona during his stay in the Marquesas? With the exception of this grocery store, very few buildings from Gauguin's time remain. The only real pilgrimage destination is the little maritime cemetery in Calvaire. Near the grave of the famous Belgian singer Jacques Brel, who also lived his last days in the Marquesas Islands, is Gauguin's resting place facing the sea. He arrived at Atuona Bay in 1901 aboard the Southern Cross. Almost immediately, he had his atelier built, which he provocatively named Maison du Jouir, roughly translated, the House of Sexual Pleasures. The building standing on the site today is a replica, its front wall inscribed with the same motto as the infamous original one. Soyez amoureuse et vous serez heureuse. Be in love and you will be happy. Although Gauguin spent only three short years in Ivaoa, from 1901 to 1903, he left such a strong impression that a century after his death, tourists the world over come here to honor his memory. The town of Atuona, which unfortunately doesn't have any of his original paintings, has hired copy artists from France to reproduce the entire body of work from Gauguin's Polynesian period for a future art center dedicated to the painter. Gauguin is an exceptional person. We admire him because he's slightly eccentric and he had his own style. I'd like to paint him my way too, but I'm sure no one would give my work any consideration. And that's what disturbs me, so I'd like to paint like him. Far from this admiration tainted with jealousy, Joe's passion is more discreet. Without respite, he searches the area around the Maison du Jouir in the hope of finding objects that once belonged to the famous painter. In a way, Gauguin's presence protected the Marquesans against abuse by the Catholic mission and colonists, and by the police. The police enjoyed fining him for electric wiring when there wasn't even electric lighting in the village. He painted extremely quickly. We know that in his first two months on the island, he shipped some 20 canvases to Volard.
The last stop on our Marquesas journey, the Aranui heads north along the Iva Oa coastline as far as Puamau. Here, unlike the other valleys of the Marquesas Islands, copra still plays an essential role in the economy of the region. But for how many more years will the holes of the Aranui be filled with sacks containing the precious pulp? <laughs> Besides its vast forests of coconut palms, Puamao has another natural treasure a famous archaeological site. Towering over the ruins of a temple once dedicated to ancient funerary rites are the giant tikis, the tallest one standing more than two and a half meters high. Unlike their cousins, the immense Moai of Easter Island, who today watch over a lost world, the tikis of Puamau are the guardians of the Marquesas culture. The seeds necessary for the revival of the Marquesan identity remain ever present in their sculptures, tattoos, their dances, and in their living language. <laughs> 